about the flyers. Could have left that one off. This is one of the weirder Lamb Before Time movies, and it's centered around Petrie. See, Petrie has come to a time in his life where he has to learn to fly and show that he's capable as a flyer. But even though it centers around Petrie, it also centers around Sarah and Tria having her new egg. Now, I will say that when Topsy, aka Mario, got reunited with this piece, it was fun to see the side of him. What I find very peculiar is she made it look like, oh my god, he's like the best person ever. He's so cute and so handsome and I always liked him. And then the moment she has a kid, she treats him like shit. They have this egg, right? <laughs> and she's staring at it and she's so excited over it. And he just jabs a little simple joke. First of all, poor Sarah, nobody cares about her right now. It's all about the egg. So understandably, she feels kind of left out. I know what that's like. But he pokes a joke. Topsy pokes a joke at Tria. It is not that serious. And the look she gives him just already lets you know that their marriage is, I don't want to say it. God damn it. Will and Jada proportions. I hate that that's a thing. I shouldn't have said, okay. Okay. That's the best adjective, though. It's so unfair. Mm, isn't it beautiful? You planning to stare at it till it hatches? <laughs> hey, I can if I want to. It is not that serious. And just look at the way he responds. Now, this is this is Sarah's dad we're talking about. This is the big, bad, buff dude who, when he wasn't around no females, everybody respected him. This is his response to her. I, 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 I know. <laughs> I, I know. Oh my sweet Jesus. It hurts. It's not just that. Look, I get it. She's excited. She's like, isn't this the prettiest egg in the whole wide world? And he's all excited too. And Sarah's like, all right, I'm gonna see myself out. It's just a freaking egg. Like we've ever seen an egg before. This is probably her first egg, understandably. It's not his first egg. He's had Sarah and others. But seriously, Tria gets to the point where she becomes borderline annoying. Do you think it's cold? Do you think it needs more grass on top? No, it's fine. I think it's cold. Come on. Then why did you fucking ask? I hate when people do that. Don't ask me no questions. Why are you asking me for suggestions and questions and advice? We're well, just gonna ignore it anyway. Why are you wasting my time and my sweet oxygen? So anyways, after she gets the grass and she starts putting it on the egg, he's just like, now here's the thing. He's trying to tell her, I think he's trying to tell her, Tria, you're doing a little bit too much. And she, the, the quickness, her attitude, that's what I'm saying, like she's one of the, the worst characters in this movie. And the thing is, the writers were consistent because she was always like that. A lot of people, they're all like, oh my God, you're so cute. You have so much power. Everyone respects you. Everyone loves you. You're so successful. And I'm hot and I want you because you're successful. But then when she gets the guy, she's like, oh, please, you're a piece of shit. Now that I've had your kid, and now that I'm known as the alpha bitch too, I don't need you. As a matter of fact, you need to go sleep in your own bed. As a matter of fact, I need to go fuck- Oh my god, they are Will and Jada. Tria, I really don't- Topsy, did you lay this egg? Um, uh, no, but I was- Then hush up and help me. Wow. If I was Sarah, I would have been like, Bitch, who are you talking to? That is my father? I do not give a damn if you're sleeping with him. I will bust your... Mm. Let someone talk to my dad like that. Let some bitch who is not... Girl, mm. Brooklyn came out. I would be damned if I sit there while I'm living there and let another bitch who is not my mother speak to my father like that. And, excuse me, from what I know, I may be wrong, but they make it seem like this is her first egg batch. It's... She didn't lay the egg, but maybe, I don't know, since he actually has a living child, uh, have you ever considered that he has more experience than you with, with helping eggs hatch? He didn't lay it, but there's a difference between laying it and helping it hatch. I can understand if you birthed it, but he is the father of the egg. He's a parent too, and he has way more experience than you when it comes to raising kids. There's one in front of you right now that you're both ignoring. So, maybe... Maybe take his advice, because he's actually, I don't know, hatched fucking eggs before. Oh my god, I'm getting so mad over a cartoon character. She's so annoying. Oh my god, he was fine before you came here. They were okay. This is what happens. This is when you have, what's what happens when you sell your soul to the purple punani. And help me. <laughs> 
can't even say anything. He has a word for everybody else, but with her, it's like, yes, dear. Oh my god, yeah. Wait, come on. I think it's too warm. <sighs> if this is the early stage of their relationship, I feel so sorry for him, but that's what you chose, dude. You could have been fine by yourself banging all the three horn chicks. And you decide to settle down with Miss- There was a reason why she's not the one he initially married. There was a reason for that, but apparently he forgot because his dick is dry. Or I don't know, his cloacal hole or hose. I don't know what the hell they use, but let's just call it dinosaur dick. Anyway, later on, Sarah goes, her stepmom and dad don't care because it's all about the eggs now. And Sarah and Spike and Ducky are watching Petrie. He's flying with his brothers and sisters. And this is the most we've ever seen of his brothers and sisters. I didn't even remember that he had had like sisters or brothers. You don't really think about genders when you're thinking about them, but there's some with some big ass eyelashes and Petrie's doing well. But for some reason, he gets distracted by his friends. They're like, oh, what's up Petrie? Hey, I completely forgot to fly while I'm seeing you guys. Like I haven't been flying for most of my life now. And he messes up the entire thing. And the whole movie is about him trying to fly and get prepared for this big day. But every time something happens and he messes up and causes all of his siblings to fail, they all go crashing down. They're understandably upset at Petrie because they're working so hard and he's the one that keeps messing stuff up. Let's uh oh no. <laughs> I know that one's eyes are closed. <laughs> but it just looks freaking haunting. Pamela, Petrie's mom, is like, what happened, Petrie? Me no no mama. So it is with the flyers. For them, the day of the flyers is a chance for young ones to show their elders they have learned how to fly with the herd. <gasps> Stand. Couldn't they always do that? Like, or maybe that's like the general, but we never see, have we ever seen a herd of flyers or a flock of flyers since the inception of Land Before Time? Like, I've always seen like small families of pterosaurs flying with each other. Have you seen a huge, you know, well, maybe we don't know everything about what happens in the Great Valley, but still just pretty odd to me that just came out of nowhere, you know? It's not fair. Petrie's a great flyer. He just has problems being bunched up in a group. Your head doesn't look normal. It never does nowadays. I don't know what's wrong with you, little foot, but Jesus Christ. Looney Tunes much? He looks like a loaf of bread. It's bothering me and I don't know why. You'll never get it right. Yeah, you don't pay attention. So Petrie's siblings start going around and they're like, look, dude, you're ruining it for all of us. And I understand why they're frustrated. And I don't know what's going on with Petrie, but this is the only shot where their horns actually look normal. You know, they kind of sloop and sloop, not drip and drap like Petrie's usually does, or like his mom's. Pamela tries to encourage Petrie, and she's like, what's going on? What, what, what's happening? Petrie? Me, try me best, okay? I do like seeing this dynamic with his mom because like before we never really see the dinosaur group with their families. They're just usually always with each other. And that's one of the things I like to do in my stories. I like to showcase how things are at home with them. Behind closed doors, away from their friends and everybody else. We don't see what it's like when they live with each other. And they started doing that with this. Now, I don't remember ever watching this movie. I think I watched parts of it, but I didn't actually watch the whole thing. And there were little small parts. And I didn't see this interaction between him and his mom. It's very real. I do like that they do that. I understand why Petrie feels very frustrated and alone. He's like, you know what? I'm gonna sleep out here. I'm gonna be by myself tonight. He sleeps out on the ledge of that little nest where he usually sleeps away from everyone. And we realize that he lives in a household where his siblings are probably always picking on him. Good night, Petrie. Night, Mom. So he starts talking to himself about, huh, oh, my brothers and sisters think I don't ever do anything right. This is the kind of person that would, like, go back home and shoot everyone. Like, <laughs> But I can understand where Petrie's coming from. And this is the cutest I've ever seen Petrie when he looks like this. Not when he looks like, like chopsticks eating sushi. That makes no sense. By the way, there's a shot that they do of Petrie when he goes to sleep and lie down. And this is how you do 3D shots like this right in the land before time. He goes to lie down and it pans out and you can see that he's on that high rise with his parents inside and the siblings. And it looks 3D. Like that was actually so well done. It doesn't look like it's a freaking Windows XP thing or something that somebody just made on freaking Blender, but they spent like two minutes making it and tried to put it up on Turbo Squid. It doesn't look like that. It looks like it belongs with the environment. Now it cuts to Sarah at home with Tria 
And this is what hurts me. I'm not a guy, but I feel this because I like my alone time. I love being alone. Like, listen, when I got married, I was like, dude, I'm only foregoing these things because this person's worth it. But he also adds to the relationship. And I add to the relationship. From what I'm seeing with Sarah's dad and Tria, she's just taking everything. He gave her a child. Okay, yeah, it's his child too. But she got prestige, respect. She got a home, someone to take care of her. And the way she treats him after she's gotten with him and gotten what she's wanted is like so horrible. Now we know from the past movies, Sarah's dad always sleeps stretched out. Sarah sleeps in one end and her dad sleeps with his legs all out and split and looking like he's just having the time of his life. He's just sleeping, having a vacation, having a good time in sleep land. Nobody interrupt him. And Tria, oh my God, she makes me want to take her horns off her face and shove them down down her eye holes but not in a way that would hurt her not like she'd bleed and die just so she'd feel ridiculous okay that's that sounds psychotic <laughs> Oh, hey. I wish someone would wake me up like that. You poke your horn in my side and stab me in my freaking sleep, you psycho. Are you insane? And he just sits and he takes it. Why? I don't understand. And then she has the nerve in the middle of the night. I'm gonna lose my shit here. I don't know why I feel it so much. I, I God, I, I tend to put myself in the character's shoes or feet or whatever, and I feel it, and that would not be happening to me. Let you wake me up like that in the middle of the night. This, this is the thing you don't understand. Because people like me are nice, people tend to take advantage of us. And yes, while I did allow myself to be taken advantage of, growing up, I have learned to stand up for myself. And I swear to God, now if someone were to do that and stab me in my sleep because of some shit and it's there's a fire or somebody is not choking or my dogs aren't dying, I'm gonna stab you back. I'm sorry. I'm gonna stab you back and I'm gonna stab you back someplace where you don't like it. You do not stab someone in their sleep. And look at why she does it. What was that for? Shh, you were about to roll onto the egg. No, he wasn't. He, he wasn't. He's nowhere near it. You're in front of it. If he were to roll over backwards, your body was in the way. It would have prevented that from happening. Okay, maybe I'm crazy. Let's look back. Look at how he shifts. Ow. He literally didn't even move that much. He just shifted himself slightly. Nayla's to say... And I have to keep reiterating this because apparently her dumb small pea brain doesn't remember this. He's had eggs before. He's way older than you. He's more experienced. You are about to roll onto the egg. Bitch, if you're that worried, how about you shift a little and you go in front of the egg. You sleep directly in front of it so nobody can roll onto it. You dumb buffoon. I, I cannot believe how much I hate this character right now. Worse than I hated Littlefoot in the previous movies. Worse than even Petrie. Like, I actually kind of sort of like Petrie now. He's still staying dead in my universe. But... I kind of like him now. She's thousands of times worse. Then look at what she pulls. Imagine being a bachelor or having lost your wife and your other kids. And you're like, all right, I took care of them till they, uh, they grew up quite a bit and then something a natural disaster happened. It's not my fault. Big old crack opens up in the middle of the freaking world. And they're on one side, I'm on the other side. We don't have wings. Nobody has jet propulsion or fart propulsion. We're, it is what it is. We say our goodbyes. We hope we find each other again. If they don't, I assume they're dead. Or she's dicking down another triceratops. Or maybe he's dicking her down. I don't know if female, females can do the whole dicking down thing. What does dicking down mean? Anyway, keep the thoughts level. <clears throat> I go through all of that. Raise my daughter by myself for years alone has done a good job with raising my daughter on my own, kept her alive. Not to, wait a minute. <laughs> oh my God, okay, I'm sorry. I just, I have a thought, yes. Remember Dina and Dinah in the one of the previous Land Before Time movies? The Saurus Rock one? They were his granddaughter and grandson. Grandchildren, whatever. Which implies, which is the same thing in my world, I made this up. I didn't even know this was the case in the actual Land Before Time movies. And I even spelled it out, but I never really processed what that meant till now. Sarah's sisters would be her age. 
they died. So if there are grandkids, Sarah can't have kids at her age. So that means that all her sisters, the only other siblings she has, if they're alive, they wouldn't have had those kids. They're way too young. So that would mean what exactly? Either it means that Sarah has older siblings. That Sarah's not Mario's first child or first batch of hatchlings. He's had probably at least one more litter who's older than Sarah, who's old enough to the point where she can have her own children and have him babysit them. Oh my God. <laughs> this has a whole new meaning. So he has way more experience than Tria. And he's taken care of them. He's also helped run the entire Great Valley and live with Sarah for most of her life. And Tria is treating him like he doesn't know anything. Like he's an idiot. She hasn't had one child. I would have been like, no, the person who's probably more ill-equipped to take care of children is probably you, Tria, since you have no experience. You'd literally be just learning as you go along, which is what most parents do with their first batch. He's had at least two, probably even more. <sighs> I was not. How do you know you were asleep? Mm. Oh my God. <sighs> I swear to God, this is, this is, okay. Just imagine an HP bar over the screen right now. And imagine that when it's full and green, it's at 100%. This just knocked off 50% of my HP bar. When the HP bar gets to like zero, I'm done with reviewing this because I, I only have so much patience. And this, this freaking triaglad, I don't know what kind of word that is, but that's what would describe her. She's driving me up the wall. I can't imagine in his scenario how he feels. He's not saying anything. Why are you doing this, Will? I mean, trial. I mean, freak. God damn it. Will. What is his name? Hold on. What's his name? Mario. Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? You know how to stand up for yourself. You stood up for yourself before you were getting bang bang and told her what you thought despite how you felt about her. Now, all of a sudden, your tongue doesn't work? Um, scoot over. Um, um, more. Oh, honey. Come on. So, <laughs> just watch the abuse that happens, right? She's like, go scoot over more. He scoot over enough that if he rolled over three freaking times, he would not be anywhere near that egg. Now, this is his nest. This is his sleeping area. It has been his sleeping area for years before she was even here. She wasn't even a member of the Great Valley. He took her in because she had nowhere to go. And let's be honest, because you know, he wanted a piece too, but so did she. She was freaking thirsty, threw herself on him without even asking him, hey, where's your wife? Never even once asked him that. And now you're telling the man he can't sleep in his spot where he always sleeps because you're freaking paranoid because you don't know how to be a parent. But he does. But just look at her freaking entitlement. It just drives me up the wall. Keep going, Topsy. You're a restless sleeper. I don't want to take a yeah. chance. So, how's this? A little more. Wow. <laughs> So that she keeps telling him to go further and further and further. Look how far away he is, bro. Look how far away this poor man is. Look how far. Look where the nest is. First of all, look where her body is. Mind you, she has not moved, right? Old hag here has not moved. The egg is here. First of all, this little branch is protecting it. She's here. Even if he rolled over, he still wouldn't reach here because she's here. He would have literally rolled into her. But she's being a spaz. A little more. More. Better safe than sorry. <sighs> Just a little bit more. <sighs> this is putting me in a bad mood. Look at his face. Look at the misery this woman caused. He was fine by himself. Fine by himself. Look at the sadness. He is tired. Gets stabbed in his sleep. Woken up and told to move away from his sleeping spot. Even though she's preventing him from rolling onto their fucking egg. Stupid bitch. <laughs> Perfect. But, oh my god. He just fell. Dinosaurs are huge. He just fell. You didn't even see, he she knew what she was doing. She wanted him to drop over that thing. She never even said, hey, watch your step. Just go sleep down there. She kept on playing that little game with him. For what reason? And then he falls. You don't even ask, hey, are you okay? Is this supposed to be funny? Is this what you're supposed to think kids are supposed to find funny? If it happened to the mother and the dad was the one doing it, nobody would be laughing. Everyone would have been like, oh my God, that's so abusive and manipulative. Oh 
no, but she does it, and it's completely fine. This dumb bitch that came from wherever the fuck she came from, and all of a sudden now, she's like, uh, yeah, uh, I'm gonna take your sleeping spot, and, um, yeah, just keep going until you hurt yourself, and I don't give a damn. Just prove she didn't even want him. Like, why are you even here then? I would've smushed that egg so fast. I mean, it's his egg too, so he wouldn't, but I hope, I, it's something would be so hilarious. You know what would be hilarious to me? If she told him to sleep down there, and then a Gallimimus or something came, or an Oviraptor, and grabbed that egg and ran away with it, and she's all like, oh my god, help! Well, maybe, bitch, if you had me sleeping beside the egg, that wouldn't have happened. I'm gonna calm down for a second, because this character is making me so mad, I can feel my neck getting red, because all the blood is, like, gushing through it like a freaking rapid. I'm being called on in my life to love people no! and to protect people <laughs> is that a service animal yeah <laughs> yeah this my cat on the mic See, they're about to tell Petrie that you're a great flyer when you're alone. Petrie admits that, uh, yeah, you're right. It's just when I'm with family, I'm not so great. Which is not true because he seems to only get distracted whenever his friends are around, which everybody seems tone deaf about. But when Donkey tries to encourage him here, Spike gets upset. And I never understood why. Well, I do not care what everybody else says, Petrie. I think you are a good flyer. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> What? I don't understand what's going on here. Why is Spike upset? And then Littlefoot goes on to say, You're really good. <gasps> when you're by yourself. I don't know if to take that as a compliment or an insult. It's just like, you're great at basketball. I mean, when, when nobody else is on the court. <laughs> it's just like, okay, I mean, you're great at dancing. Just when no one's watching you. <laughs> this kind of sounds... Kind of like a half insult, half compliment. I mean, if you're a good flyer, you should be able to just fly. Flying for Nick Petrie is a natural way of moving around. For a pterosaur, for a pterodon, that is their natural way of moving. Actually, they're awkward on the ground. Very awkward. They are better in the air. I mean, the air for a pteranodon is like the water for a crocodile. That is their element. So I could say that me swimming, if I'm really good at swimming or I'm okay at swimming, having legs, my natural element is the ground. So what they essentially just said to Petrie is the same as someone saying to me, oh, you're a great walker, you know, just when you're not around people. <laughs> That means I'm not a great walker. What the hell? I should be, if I'm a great walker, in my natural element, I should be able to move naturally like everybody else. If I'm not, then there's a problem. So Petrie tries to fly, and this looks really good. Look at the trees in the background. This is the best I've ever seen the animation for the trees. I can say that one thing the animation has gotten down is trees and water. I hate doing that. Trees and water. Say it naturally. Water. It sounds weird now. Water. Sounds better. I don't know what's wrong with me. Petrie, because it's windy, which doesn't count, he collides to some tall grass and everyone's like, what the frick is that? And then out comes a creature who they decide to call Guido. I shit you not. For anyone who doesn't know, Guido is an Italian term. It's usually derogatory. It's like an insult. It means a man who's usually of Italian origin, who's like super full of himself, he doesn't know how to be around people. He's like a sociopathic type of vain, macho, over the top kind of person, which doesn't really fit Guido's personality. Other people may say it's for the working class man, but every time I've heard it growing up in Brooklyn, being around other, other Italian Americans, it's always been seen as derogatory for someone who's like stupid airhead. That's how they used it there. Uh, sorry, did I scare you? I, I have that effect on folks sometimes. <laughs> Okay. Everyone 
everyone's gathered around Guido. Mario eventually shows up and he's like, yo, I don't care what you are, who you are, but some of us are trying to hatch eggs around here. You're being mighty loud. Guido makes some awkward, unfunny jokes. And then he's like, I wouldn't walk that way if I were you. As Sarah's dad starts to walk off and he ends up falling into a puddle. And the way that Sarah is scared for him actually makes sense. You see, the way Sarah acts, this way it shows that these people know exactly what they're doing. Tria doesn't care about Mario. Mario fell, Sarah heard her dad fall, and she was worried. Look at the... <laughs> One eye is like facing that direction, and this eye is facing... What, what the hell is going on with this thing? Jesus Christ. Anyway, hear how Sarah is worried about her father when he falls. Huh? Oh. Daddy, are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> Only when she comes over and sees that her dad's okay, he's moving, he's not dead. She's like, okay, he just fell in some mud, he's fine. It's not a deep drop, she knows her dad is fine. If she had seen him writhing in pain or screaming out or something, she wouldn't have been laughing. She was more concerned with him first and then she laughed afterwards. That's what you do with someone that you love. Tria didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, Ducky, remember that smash from the last movie? Look at how she laughs and then forgets that, oh shit, is Sarah laughing? <laughs> <laughs> she remembered the last movie when Sarah almost killed her. She says, Don't ever call my dad that again. Got it? Yup. <laughs> that was a PTSD that Ducky had. She was like, oh, gotta be careful. <laughs> when it comes to Sarah and her dad. <laughs> so after Sarah's father is like, who do you think you are? He's mad at him. He's like, it's okay, sir. Um, I I'll jump in the water too. I mean, I'll jump in the mud too. See, now we're both muddy. And then Sarah's dad's like, yeah, just what we need. Another weirdo. <laughs> so Guido doesn't fit in with everyone. Everyone's trying to figure out what he is. He spends the whole time in the Great Valley trying to fit in. They all follow him around and or have him follow them and spend different time with the family. So like, you have a long neck and you have this, maybe you're one of us. Clearly he looks like none of them, but they're just stupid. He's definitely not a swimmer. And once again, Petrie messes up with his flight, but no one seems to think he's a flyer, whatever. Even though he has what clearly looks like wings on him. Me worst flyer in Valley. When Petrie is down and he doesn't want to talk to his friends or see his family, Guido becomes his new friend and basically encourages him. And I'm getting some vibes. I know it sounds stupid. I'm just telling you what I see. Y'all looking at the thumbnail. I did not get that from Google images or some weird site that was in the movie. So Guido encourages Petrie and says, hey, that role you did was really good. It was really nice. And Petrie starts to feel really good about having Guido around. His forehead looks long as F. Oh my God. Is it just like the, the angle? Does he get sadder and it, it stretches out more? I don't know what the heck is going on. It's something just looks off. He looks like an eggplant. I don't know if that's by design. After Guido encourages Petrie, everyone is like, oh my God. Mr. Tops' egg is ready to hatch. And that's how you know that he is popular with everyone because for Ducky's sisters and brothers and everybody else's, the whole Grey Valley doesn't come around and try to watch. So the baby is born. And the baby's name is Trisha, which is funny in my world. I made this completely up before seeing this movie, but in my world, Sarah's big sister's name was Trisha. So Topsy starts crying. Like this is like the only time we see him cry. After Tria's crying, he cries because it's like, it's his child. He has another child, another daughter. And you know, he's, he's so happy. And she says, she's so beautiful. Go on, Sarah, meet your new sister. Trisha falls in love with Sarah. She loves Sarah and Sarah loves her too. But Sarah does get a little bit jealous because she feels like her father and her stepmom don't see her anymore. Back at Petrie's home, this is like a recreation from the first movie because they eat berries, which is weird. I also found it very strange that earlier on when they were trying to figure out what Guido was or how he would fit into the different species in the Great Valley, when Petrie and his brothers and sisters were eating and then Guido was like, ooh, an earthworm, I'll eat that. They were all grossed out by it. Petrie brings Guido home with him and I like 
like how his mom plays him off. Petrie tries to tell his family, like, we have a new family member. Like, he's going to be staying with us forever. His mom cleared that up real quick. Hey, kids, he's our guest. <laughs> Pamela's like, he ain't staying here. Let me care that up real quick. Unless I bring somebody home, they're not a member of this family. <laughs> So the siblings all turn around and start picking on Petrie. And I like how Guido cuts in and protects Petrie. You messed up again, Petrie. Yeah. Yeah. yeah! yeah! Fellas, come on, give him a break. And you know what? Good on Guido for at least having the common sense and bravery enough to defend his friend. Especially in his own household. You come into somebody's house with their family and then you're talking to his siblings like that? That's some balls. Uh, of course he gets confused when he flies with you. Your rear ends look just like your faces, so, uh, how can he tell which way to go? <laughs> oh my god, and then the looks on their faces? <laughs> They're like, what? <laughs> yeah, their faces, they are like, did you, did you just? But surprisingly, they all break down laughing, because, I mean, Ser seriously, Petrie's family, even the mother's laughing. S Petrie's family, his siblings are very tough. They bully, but they also can take it. Petrie is the most sensitive person out of all of them, which is why they pick on him because they can. While Petrie is sleeping, Guido wakes him up and tells him, look, you're my friend and I'm gonna help you get ready for that big day of yours, okay? And Petrie's like, why are you freaking waking me up, bro? Okay, sure, why not? Like he doesn't actually believe it. Petrie, what the hell happened to Petrie's eye? What happened just now? I just saw something really weird. What was that? Ew, a little bit of color discrepancy there. I don't know, it just caught my eye for a second. Looks gross. And then, we, I don't know, the way Guido acts with Petrie sometimes, he acts like he likes him or something. I'll show you what I'm talking about. So Tria asks Sarah to watch Trisha. Trisha really likes her. But then Trisha ends up running out and finding her legs and Sarah has to chase her. Ow! And then because Sarah can't see, she tripped over and accidentally drops Trisha. Trisha starts crying. Of course, the mother comes back and is like, what's going on? Why is she crying? And then Sarah's like, uh, she bumped me in the eye, and then I was trying to chase her when she was walking, and she bumped me in the eye, and I fell, and I like how she just goes right past, and it's like, oh my god, she was walking, and completely ignores that Sarah was hurt, and of course this makes Sarah feel as though nobody cares about her. I had a similar situation happen to me, where my bigger cousin had taken me, and I was still little too, I think I was like six, and she had taken me to her best friend's house. Her best friend was basically a teen mom, and she had this baby, who funny enough, her name was Dana. Anyway, little baby and I loved each other, we used to play all the time, I think the baby was like two, and I'm still like almost a baby myself. So we're playing, this this baby has teeth. I don't know what age the baby was. Baby could walk, but kind of wobbly. She has fat little legs, and she had a few of those little teeth. We're playing around, and she slobbers on me and then bites the shit out of me. I did not know babies could bite so freaking hard. It really hurt. I screamed because I was in such pain. Nobody came running. Nobody came running. I screamed pretty loud because it hurt and I was crying. And knowing my nature, because I like to bite when I was little, I bit her back. I'm like, you bite me, bitch. I'm gonna bite you back. So I went over to her shoulder and I bit her back on her shoulder. She just looked at me and she's like, Aah! and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, the host of all heaven and earth and the freaking Atlantis come down and descend upon us. What happened to the baby? Did you not hear me screaming and crying before? What, the baby cries and all of a sudden, all, it is what it is? So I was crying and I'm like, she bit me, so I bit her back. You bit my baby, bitch? What? <laughs> no, I get most people would be like, it's just a baby. Yeah, but I'm also a child. And while it's not the baby's fault, she fucking bit me. I had a freak, she broke the freaking skin. I am not sorry to this day. Cause I bet your ass that baby don't bite nobody else. Funny enough, she didn't. Baby's not stupid. She knows exactly that, hey, there's a cause and effect. Her primitive mind is like, holy shit, when I bit this thing, it bit me back. Probably shouldn't do that. Watch babies, I guarantee you, when they do something and there's a negative reaction to that thing, they don't do that thing again. Now, little foot and everyone is eating and there is something that haunts my nightmares. <laughs> It took me a while to understand why it looked the way it did, why he looked the way he did, and I had to pause it. They're all eating, <laughs> and Littlefoot's eating, 
okay, he's eating and they look whatever. Ducky and Spike are eating and they're all talking about whatever. Spike eats Ducky's food, which you know what? I can understand why Ducky would be mad at him because Spike clearly saw that Ducky was in the middle of eating it and he thinks it's funny to go over and eat people's food. When it's been shown in the movie where he met that other Spike tail, he doesn't like it when people eat his food that he's about to eat. It's very rude. And then we pan back over to Littlefoot and we see this. Do you have any idea what's happening right now? Because he looks like a sandworm. This image is so freaking cursed. What I think happened is somebody forgot to take his back color and continue it onward and then color it up his neck and color his head. I don't care about all the other color mistakes. Okay, I do care about them. I can't even understand Mr. Top's ponytail situation. But really, this for the main character who's the mascot of the series? This is what we're doing? This is what we're doing in one of the newest Land Before Time movies? <sighs> And then Spike eats Ducky's food, and he knows she ate Ducky's food. And then look at him acting all innocent. Spike! I wish I could smack him in his freaking face, dude. I would have been like, open your mouth. Open your freaking mouth and poured all that food out. Because it's not the first time he's done this. He does that on purpose, knowing how it makes Ducky feel. She's smaller than you. I get that you need food, but she's smaller than you. You should be protecting her. I don't want to hear, oh, he's a baby. He doesn't know better. He knows damn well what he's doing. He and Ducky are the same age. He hatched, what, three days, two days after she did? They're still the same age. They're not exactly the same age, like born on the same day, but they're born in the same year or century or however it is they age. They're close enough in age for him to understand. He understands. Sarah comes to vent to her friends about how her dad and Tree is acting and how upset she is because she feels kind of left out. And Littlefoot replies with this, which, <laughs> which is one of the reasons why I can't stand him because he is acting as though his, the situation is completely opposite for him. Hey, listen, at least your dad's with you. And Tria seems really nice. Why are you saying that like your dad is dead? You had a choice to go with your father and you chose not to go. So that's a very weird statement. I know he's trying to make her feel better, but it's not like your dad couldn't be with you because he had previous engagements. He wanted you to come with him and you chose not to go. Now, yeah, I understand why he chose to be with his grandparents, but the way he said it was like, oh. Well, my dad couldn't be with me, so... Yes, he could've. You didn't go with him. Sure, if Sarah's dad were to do that, despite her friends, she would still go with her father. It's not really what Sarah wants to hear right now. So they start talking or singing about changes and how everything changes and they don't like change. And how sometimes change can be a good thing. Sarah's an ESTJ personality, so she doesn't do well with change. She likes things the way they are. If she has something that's set up and her life is in a routine and she likes it and she's comfortable and then something comes along and makes her uncomfortable and upends her entire life, she doesn't do well with that. Now we go back to Guido and Petrie because Petrie is feeling kind of under the weather. It's at night and this is the part where I'm like, I know that they're supposed to be friends. It's supposed to be a friendly situation. I also know that based on the way Guido sounds, he's a bit older than Littlefoot and the others. I'm not the first person to point this out because it looks kind of weird, in my opinion. I could be totally wrong though. But he's comforting Petrie, Petrie's outside, and this little interaction just feels so freaking strange to me. Okay, now remember Petrie, you can do anything they can do, all right? It's just a matter of doing it at the same time. Well, yeah, at the same time. So the fuck? What is happening right now? <laughs> Why? That would make me more anxious. I mean, I get that Guido's probably not used to this, but you are all up on him. It just looks weird, dude. Like seeing this with no context. Just okay, I'm gonna play it with no sound, and you tell me how it looks. Does that look kosher to you, bro? I haven't watched this before, so I can't tell you what I thought back then, but I can tell you what I think now. And as an animator, someone who's an adult making this, it looks bizarre. It looks bizarre. And I'm sorry, if a friend of mine or some stranger who's older than me comes up behind me and starts doing that while my back end is up against his front end, it's gonna also feel very bizarre, depending on whether or not I like the person. Regardless, it's still bizarre. You know, <laughs> the animators know what they're doing. <sighs> Okay, let me stop. <laughs> let 
laughing stop just not god anyway now you gotta figure out what are your motives guido poor petri this is parents watch your kids <laughs> watch your watch your kids guido agreed to be like i'll help you and i thought oh he's his friend he'll do it but i swear to god as someone who has been a victim of stuff like this this is exactly the same way shit like this started happening to me somebody much older was like yeah i'll help you i'm gonna make sure you do i'm gonna teach you how to do this and then they touch you weird and then they go behind you and touch you and then you're like oh okay that's very strange but oh well that's just their way of showing that they're being encouraging but they only do it when your parents are not around and nobody else is around and when you're both totally alone give me a fucking break maybe i'm biased because i'm seeing it from that lens but that's just maybe you tell me in the comments whether or not i'm doing too much but we know it's altiori you always do too much so just keep telling yourself i'm going to pass my flying test go go ahead say it <laughs> Into who knows, but Petrie repeats what he says, and he's like, All right, uh, yeah, yeah, I can do this. So everyone goes out to practice. When Tria gets up one night, thank goodness she's not making Topsy sleep in the freaking sky, she sees that Trisha is sleeping beside her big sister. In the morning, everyone is practicing. Petrie actually does a good job this time, and he does everything he's supposed to do and gets it completely right. What Guido has been doing has been helping him. And here's the other thing. Like, I'm no, I hate, I hate pointing out stuff like this. Petrie's very loving. He doesn't do this with Sarah. He doesn't do this with Spike. He does it sometimes with Littlefoot. But the only time I've seen him do this, this kind of like hug and look, whatever, strange interactions is when he's doing it with Ducky. And he doesn't even really do it with Ducky like this. So Guido's on the ground. He lands and Petrie runs up to him and hugs him. All right. Go, Petrie! Yeah! I don't know, dudes. I don't know if the animators were doing this on purpose. Because I know sometimes people try to put stuff in there. But it feels hella sus to me, dude. The way they're all close to each other's faces like that, it could mean completely nothing. So finally, Petrie is in good standings with his siblings. Guido feels as though he's now a third wheel, but everyone invites him to come along. While everyone is sleeping, Petrie feeling accomplished, Guido right by him. Guido sleepwalks, and Petrie realizes, holy shit, you sleepwalk, dude? He follows him and pass by the other's nests, and they wake up and see, or hear, Petrie calling out. Ducky also wakes up, thinking she's dreaming and seeing a nightmare, and she's like, oh crap. So they all start following him. Then Ducky says she has to go back and get Sarah. Sarah would be very mad if we went and had an adventure without her. In my story, Sarah and Ducky are basically best friends. So now watching this movie, I kind of feel like this is where they would have started from, like their closeness. Sarah's mad because she's like, okay, let me get this straight. You woke me up in the middle of the night to follow someone across the Great Valley who's sleeping? The whole time they try to help Guido navigate without waking him up. Because waking someone up who's sleepwalking is bad. And I already knew what was going to happen. Petrie also found it weird that when he took his eye off of Guido for one second, Guido's like a lot further than he was. Like he's teleporting. Guido's about to fall over a gap. Now, this is where the stupidity comes in, right? This is horrible writing in my opinion because earlier on when Guido was walking into a lava pit they came in front of him and formed a way so that he would walk on top of them and walk around. I'll show you. And my dad always told me not to let anyone walk all over me. See what they did there? They came in front of him, ran in front of him, and were like, all right, we have enough time. Let's run in front of him. He's walking at a steady pace. Let's go in front of him. He'll walk on us and walk in the direction we show him, just like what you do with ants on your hand. So tell me why, when they seem about to walk around the gap, they're like, let's use all the time we have while he's walking at this very slow pace all the way down to this crevasse and let's find something. Oh, wait, 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 there's a tree. Let's try to move this tree all the way over to the gap to like the time that they are wasting right now instead of, I don't freaking know, do exactly what you did just a few seconds ago and go in front of him and redirect him. They're doing this so that they won't have to do this in time so we can see that Guido can fly. Because obviously, he has wings. It doesn't take long for the audience to put together that he could freaking fly. Look at all the time they're wasting. They could have gone in there and redirected him in the same way they did with the lava pit. Why are writers like this? It makes no fucking sense. 
Look, and what if you hit him with the freaking log? What if the log is not big enough to go over the crevasse? What if the log wasn't there to begin with? You know what I'm saying? You don't even have to wake him up. Just pick him up. You already, like, pushed him and touched him before. So why don't you just pick him up and redirect him? These people are so freaking stupid. And the amount of times that trees magically fall in place without hitting people or squishing them and just managing to fit exactly the distance that one piece of land is from the other is getting so freaking old in the Land Before Time franchise. I swear to God, that part made me so freaking mad. So everyone runs across because the log is falling. I kind of half expected Spike to fall. That would have been hell yeah. <laughs> that would have been funny. Oh, I'm trying to be edgy and cool like those movies with slow motion, but it looks dumb. Then they see Guido coming back and they're like, oh no, we can't catch him in time. Guido, no! And he falls and Petra's like, oh no. And as Guido is falling, his wings come out because, you know, he has wings the entire time. People didn't know what feathers were, I guess. So they're like, oh, it's just probably fur. And they're like, he can fly? He sleep flies, dude? Guido ends up flying into the mysterious beyond. I also forgot to mention that Guido has amnesia. He doesn't remember who he is or where he came from, who his family is, if he has any family. He lands in the mysterious beyond and wakes up and he's like, guys, where is everyone? He thinks he's still back at Petrie's place, but he lands on what looks to be the back of a creature. And of course, guess what it is? Turns out to be a Spinosaurus, you know, because Spinosaurus was trending back then. Spinosaurus had eaten Guido, but G Guido ends up tickling it with his feather. It laughs and he gets away. So while Guido's fighting, Petrie comes and picks him up just in time to save his life. See how strong Petrie is? Guido is larger than Ducky, but he has feathers, so most of that is probably just fluff. But Petrie could have picked him up too. Petrie could have carried him away from the edge. Whatever. The Spinosaurus chases them and Petrie's like, why don't you just fly yourself? And Guido's like, I can't. The friends try to help, but they end up getting chased too. And there always happens to be a rock or a tree they can pass under that allows them to be stuck. And seriously, I like the way this Spinosaurus runs like a chicken. It's head staying stationary where the rest of its body is moving. Very cool. And it gets stuck. Woohoo. Can't, you know, backward back up and do anything i'm stupid all i'm thinking is petrie it's his big day is tomorrow or in a few hours and he's not gotten any sleep when the rest of his siblings and mother wake up they're like petrie's not here and the mom's like you're gonna have to just do it without him when guido asks why he cut all the way over to the mysterious beyond everyone stops and says you can fly bro little trisha baby trisha is woken up when she hears the flyers getting ready for their big day the judges are making their way to the panel little foot and the others are just arriving back petrie flew ahead of them and little and them said that they catch up. Trisha's like, I want to see. Pamela's cheering on her children. And of course, so is Guido, who would encourage Petrie to just be himself. So Petrie takes Guido's advice over everybody else's and starts doing these weird tricks. And everyone's like, what are you doing, Petrie? And of course, his siblings start doing the same thing. One of his sisters goes up and she does tricks too. Basically, this whole point of changing up what the days of the flyers looks like is to change how they've always done things to encourage uniqueness. Being able to work together, but still being yourself while you're doing it and not just conforming to what everybody else does. And I do like that message. They're still able to do cool tricks together and wow the judges while also being themselves and doing individual things. Love me wing to the bend in my feet. The flip flap and fly song is actually fire. I'm not gonna lie. I really hope I Marquise makes a remix of some of these Lamb Before Time songs. That'd be amazing. Flip flap, flip flap and fly. Now what was weird is when they're singing a verse of the song, I didn't even catch this the first time I watched the movie. They go down and look who pops up from the water. I said it normally, see that? Flip -flap. Isn't that freaking Mo? That's Mo from the last movie. I mean, it looks like him, or maybe it's a girl version. I don't know. It's kind of chunky, too. That might not be Mo. That might be somebody else. But they did that to show, hey, guys, remember Mo? Remember him? What was kind of messed up is that Petrie is going around, and he ends up causing an egg to get lost, and nobody cares. Now, to be fair, I mean, Petrie's an asshole, but to be fair, why the hell would you lay your eggs on something like this that's wide out in the open and is on, like, a thin-ass thread twig of a thing they can easily get knocked over. Very strange. That's the law of attraction. Not law of attraction. God damn it. I got it mixed up. What's it called again? Survival of the fittest? No, that's not it. Natural selection. There you go. He plays with the mo creature some more. Even the judges get in. They're like, oh, it's never gonna be the same. You've changed the day of the flyers forever. It's even more fun than 
it was before, and you did that, Petrie. Meanwhile, the egg, away from its parents, just randomly hatches at the judge's feet, and they're like, yay, let's throw you up in the air, and, uh, where did the baby go? Did they just throw away the baby? Holy shit, these guys just threw- What in the homicide? Did they take a hatching baby while it was falling and just yeet it away? What the fuck? And they're laughing. Look at them having fun. They're psychos. I thought he was gonna catch the baby, but he doesn't. If the baby never hatched, they're like, oh, look, good luck. Oh my god, the baby's gonna hatch. And the baby just magically knows how to fly. Which makes no freaking sense, because when Petrie is born, he did not know how to fly. Or maybe that was just him. I do know there were other little babies, like the ones that tried to cheer up Littlefoot in the first movie, that they could fly immediately, but it hadn't hatched yet. It was in the middle of hatching. And all those flyers are going at amazing speeds, and you throw that poor egg out there, you don't even know who the parent is. Like, what the hell is going on? This is so freaking disturbing, and it's so weird how everyone's having fun, but nobody cares that someone just tried to murder a freaking baby before it was born. See, they really use the 3D thing a lot in this, and they actually did it right. And how did he know to go back to his nest? How do you, you know where your nest was? Anyway, everything is happy until poor Trisha ends up walking too close to the edge and falls in. She's crying, and Tria and Mario hear her. So do Littlefoot and his friends. Guido also hears her. He tries to fly because everyone told him he could, but he's like, oh shit, uh, maybe this was a mistake. I don't know how to fly. And then in the last moment, he opens up his wings and he's like, oh, I can save the baby. Petrie also sees her and he doesn't finish his tournament or his celebration or whatever. Guido grabs onto the baby, but she's too heavy and they both start drowning, which is like, okay. And they're going over a waterfall. Petrie at the last moment tries to help. And this is how strong Petrie is. Everyone's like, he can't, he can't pick up Ducky. He can't save her because she's probably too heavy and whatnot. Petrie is very strong. He has picked up Ducky lots of times with ease. He's able to hold on to Guido, who's holding on to a baby Tricera freaking tops. And he's still able to keep afloat. That's a testament to how strong Petrie is. The siblings don't finish their celebration either or their tournament or whatever it is supposed to be. They all forego their contest to work together to help bring baby Trisha back to safety as well as Guido. They're all running to her and Trisha sees Sarah and as a baby she's stupid so she's like let me wiggle and drop to the bottom. Poor Tria and Mary are like no. The baby is falling from a very high height and somehow, somehow Sarah catches her and the baby is not impaled on her horn or doesn't break her freaking hips when she comes to a Superman stop. Finally, everyone pays attention to Sarah and her dad's like, I gotta take care of my other baby too. I'm glad my other baby's okay. <sighs> <sighs> you can get off him now, Petrie. Look how Guido's looking at him. She's so freaking... <laughs> I see you guys. I see what's happening. Hey. Great job, Petrie. Wow, that's the first time I've ever heard Mario say that to him. Uh, Aww. Aww. Aww, how cute. So it's all happy. And even though Petrie and his siblings are probably gonna have to do it over again, they're like, we don't care. I mean, it's fun. Sarah's father also thinks Guido and says he is really one of a kind. I have a theory as to why he is, but anyway. Sarah is so happy that her little sister knows her name. And then they do the stupid freaking 3D thing again. Uh, please, for the love of God, please no. Okay. All right, it doesn't look as bad as it usually looks. They fix it a little bit, but Jesus. Okay, it's not that bad. Why is everyone congregating right now? What's the big deal? I guess they heard the baby crying and they want to see if the baby's okay. But Petri is finally happy and he has his confidence back and even more so, his siblings and he are close now. He's earned their respect. Whew, Jesus Christ, this movie was something. This movie was something. I think also, as a, a strange theory, Guido probably did have a family and a community, but he was kicked out of it for reasons. Or maybe it's a room Mr. Robot situation where something very horrible happened happened to him that he blacked it out. Because remember how it starts off and he doesn't have his memories of who he is or who his family is or where he came from? It's never explained. Never ever again. They just leave it as is. Which is more realistic, but just odd. Anyway, this doodle is about a mixed breed dog who's probably part husky and saluki and who has given birth to two pups in a deep forest. Fearing humans and not trusting them after she had been adopted when she was younger and then abandoned, she'll never trust humans again. 
Now it's up to her to take care of her pups and do everything she can to keep them safe. Annette had always wanted babies. Her puppy Lyle and her other puppy Dober are the complete opposites when it comes to their character. Lyle being very sweet and kind and curious, while Dober is more pugnacious, rough and tough, and better suited to survive even while Mama's not around. When she goes off to find food, he kills mice and rodents and other things that he shouldn't be able to at his age. There's also a bit of sibling rivalry going on because Lyle seems to get a little bit more tender care from his mother, which Dober resents. Thanks so much for watching. This has been Ultiori. You ask the answer.